incident took place, the, the location where the incident took place? Correct. I was, I was told that there was, it occurred at Kristen's house. Okay. Did you then go to Ms. Wilson's home? I did later, yes. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the state has rested its case in chief. Uh, that does mean that there is some business that we have to take up uh, outside your presence. All right, that was it. Very short uh, presentation in that it was just one day, a half day from the state of Tennessee, but effective, especially bringing the victim on the stand, alleged victim, the Defendant says that these were self-inflicted wounds. Will he take the stand? Let's bring in State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg. He's in Palm Beach County, Florida, and Criminal Defense Attorney Kim Benjamin. She's in Kansas City, Missouri. Good morning to both of you. Dave, this case, uh, short and sweet for the state. They, you know, the picture shows a thousand words. You look at that not on that woman's uh, face, and um, it enrages anybody who sees that. Um, how effective do you think the state has been here with this such a short um, case that is pretty simple at this point. And, and then the other question, does the defendant have to take the stand? Yeah, good morning, Ted. I think the defendant's gonna definitely take the stand because he's a reality star and that's what egomaniacs do. He thinks he can persuade the jury with his charm and his good looks, but I don't think it's gonna work. The testimony of the victim was very powerful. And you know, in domestic violence cases, it's our experience that most of the victims do not cooperate with prosecutors. And so you have a cooperative victim who took the stand in a very powerful way. And I think that's gonna have a lot of sway with the jury. And by the way, it's not just her word against his. You've got a witness, the neighbor who called police and you've got those photos. All this is quite damning. And Kim Benjamin, you have a uh, police officer that says the, vic the, the defendant was acting erratically. Um, things adding up against him. The idea that a, a woman would um, self-inflict uh, these wounds to get back and get at him or something, that this was all orchestrated and this is it, you know, that she's played it out perfectly and here we are in court. Um, that's basically the allegation that he was making pre-trial uh, in the media. That, that's a stretch, is it not? And, and what's your take on what he could say to get out of this now that the jury has seen these photos and seen the alleged victim on the stand right next to them talking. Good morning, Ted. Uh, absolutely, her uh, testimony is persuasive. Her the, the photos are very persuasive. Is it unheard of for someone to fake an accusation like this? It's not unheard of. Is it going to fly? Are they going to believe him? And I agree with uh, the prosecutor he, that they're going to that he is going to testify, in my opinion. Uh, will they agree with him that that's what she did? Only if he can really show the motive. Uh, if, if he can't show that she has motive to do that and some uh, ulterior motive here, then I think it is a difficult defense. Dave, if you were prosecuting this case, would you be waking up today licking your chops, hoping he takes the stand or um, hoping he doesn't? This is the kind of thing we prosecutors dream about. Yes, we are licking our chops because you've got this arrogant defendant who thinks he can just smile and charm the jury and just ignore the fact that he there's so much evidence against him. And that's why the case was short. They didn't need to do a lot of talking. You saw the photos, you heard the testimony, and he's gonna get up and use the old 1970s defense. Hey, she fell down the stairs or she hit a wall on her own. Well, those defenses don't work so well anymore. And I think, uh, it, he's walking into a trap. I mean, he's going in there probably against maybe his lawyer's wishes, or at least I can envision that he's probably not doing the preparation that he probably needs to, thinking he could just talk his way out of it. Uh, but I don't think it's going to work. Kim, if you're representing him in this case, would you be advising him not to take the stand? Or is this, uh, after what we've seen from the state, the only way? Um, obviously, a plea deal was the way out of this, but uh, that didn't happen. Here we are now. Um, what would you do if you were representing him? If I didn't have any other witnesses that could put on the defense, and the only witness I have who can put on the defense is my client, then I would likely recommend that he take the stand. I'm one of the rare ones that believes if a client has a story to tell that is believable and truthful and that the jury um, gets to hear from the defendant, then it's very helpful for the defense. But it's a tough call because um, 
it, it, does he have any other witnesses that support his story? And if he doesn't, then he is the only one that can do it. And when it comes to preparation, uh, an, an attorney would be uh, out of their mind if they didn't uh, prepare him for days for this testimony. Yeah, and uh, we'll, have, we'll see. About 45 minutes from now, we're expecting the judge to take the bench, and that is when we will find out what... in their live coming up an update on the case against the doomsday couple arizona police released an interview with lori vallow's daughter tylee this was done about three months before she disappeared uh and you hear her re her rendition of what happened to her stepfather charles vallow on the day he died that's coming up next Welcome back. A motions hearing is set for this afternoon in Florida versus Nicholas Cruz. The alleged Parkland school shooter is on trial for battery of an officer while in jail. For the last two days, we have been dipping into the voir dire process right here on Court TV, the first phase of jury selection. The court ended up screening a total of 288 prospective jurors. They came up with nine panels, 32 people in each panel that came through the courtroom and out of all of those prospective jurors, 106 have been pre-qualified. They'll return October 18th for the next round. Testimony is set to begin the next day on October 19th. It's an arduous process. Normally, a case like this would be quick. And jury selection, take a few hours, boom, be in and out in a day. This is a different case because of the defendant. Still with us, State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg. He's in Palm Beach County, Florida, and Criminal Defense Attorney Kim Benjamin in Kansas City, Missouri. And Dave, you know this case well. You're in the state of Florida. It was, the entire country was affected by the Parkland shooting, Florida especially. High-profile cases, when you have a defendant like this, um, it is different selecting a jury. They're going through that process. Yesterday, something unique happened. He broke down and, and started crying um, in front of the prospective jurors. The prosecution came out and said that they were giving him crayons, basically, these colored pencils. They were saying, you're making him look like a child on purpose, trying to bring in um, some, some sympathy, empathy from these prospective jurors. Was that out of line, and, and is that something you have to watch for, especially in a case like this? Because prospective jurors, when they walk in, they're looking for that defendant, and they, they're monitoring him all the time, are they not? Yeah, that's a good point, Ted. Yes, they are. And that's why the prosecutors had a problem with it. And the judge did, too, because they didn't want to make this defendant look like a child in front of the jury by giving him crayons and a coloring book. And that's essentially what the defense wanted. They wanted him to chill out, and that's how he chills, is to color. But the judge said, no, we're not going to let him do that. He can take notes for his own defense. He can have a pen issued by the court. He can have a pad, but he's not going to be able to color. And this case is really close to here, Ted, the, the, uh, the city of Parkland is only three miles south of the Palm Beach County border. And so we have a real interest in it, uh, but it is a national issue because anytime 17 innocent young people get slaughtered, that's something that captivates everyone and people are demanding justice. And this case all happened in 2018. And so justice has been delayed until now. Kim, this case that's going on now has nothing to do with, theoretically, the Parkland shooting, but it does because the state wants a conviction here so they can use it then in the penalty phase as they pursue the death penalty against Nicholas Cruz. It, there's a lot more at stake than a normal battery charge in a jail, um, and it, it is different. What's your thought on, on the, and, and I didn't ask Dave this on purpose because he is so close to it, What's your thought on the state going after the death penalty when this individual has said, I will plead out guilty. I'll plead guilty life without parole. But as Dave said, they want justice. They want this to go through and they want the death penalty. Your take. My take on when prosecutors decide to go for the death penalty is that it oftentimes is what they think the public wants from them or maybe is politically driven, but they're not necessarily polling the public and finding out what the public thinks and feels. In this kind of case, when you have 
a tremendous loss in the community. And you have um, a lot of families uh, across that state, if not the country, who are emotionally connected to the story. Uh, it, it's hard not to, it's hard uh, to imagine them not wanting to seek the death penalty. But on the flip side of that, uh, as a proponent against the death penalty myself, I completely understand why it could be in the state's best interest and the public's best interest to allow for a plea deal where someone stays in prison for the rest of their lives and they have no opportunity for parole. They're it, it saves the state a lot of money. It saves the families a lot of grief. And frankly, many families who are polled and many uh, people connected to death penalty cases who are polled and asked about their experience talk about how horrendous it is on their lives, their emotional and mental well-being, actually. So it, if if we, it, it, I can understand why they're doing what they're doing, but I think also uh, there is a reason not to go for the death penalty and just to let him accept a plea deal and be in prison for the rest of his life. Yeah, all right. Uh, we're going to switch topics. Let's turn to the doomsday couple case. Chad Daybell and his wife, Lori Vallow, are charged with multiple crimes, including first-degree murder murder for the deaths of Lori's two children, J.J. and Tylee. Lori also faces conspiracy to commit first-degree murder in the death of her former husband, Charles Vallow. Lori's brother, Alex Cox, said he shot and killed Charles Vallow, but that it was in self-defense in Chandler, Arizona. Now police in Arizona have released all of their files from the investigation into Charles Vallow's death, and part of that is a video. A video of police questioning 16-year-old Tylee the day that Charles was killed. This interview happened in July of 2019. Tylee was last seen in public two months later in September of 2019. She ended up, of course, dead uh, just a few months after this video. Take a listen. So I woke up probably around like 7.50, I want to say, because I heard yelling from like right outside my door. And I don't even know where, but I immediately like jumped up. And I have a baseball bat because when I was living at my uncle's, by myself, I just wanted something to, like, mm -hmm. feel safer, and I'm not old enough to get, like, pepper spray or anything, so I was like, okay, I'll get a baseball bat. So I have that. So your bedroom, you said that right outside your bedroom door, and I didn't go in the house, so I'm at okay. a little bit of a disadvantage. So, so what is your bedroom door open to? My bedroom door open, so the room that my uncle was staying in, the room that's kind of like the guest room, if my room's right here, that's right there. Okay. And then... My um, little brother's room, and then kitchen's kind of back here, so it's like a little hallway, and okay. then right here is kind of where everything happened. Okay. Like the big, you walk in, and... Like gr big, great room, kind of living room. Yeah, right now it just has mirrors up, because my mom wanted a dance room, okay. so... Yeah. Okay. Kind of unconventional, but... Hey, okay. whatever makes you happy, it's your guys' house, so... Right? So, yeah, I immediately just jumped up, and I grabbed my baseball bat, and I opened the door, and it was... My stepdad, you know, outside the doorway, and then my uncle kind of in the doorway, and then I could hear my mom behind him, and he was just screaming at both of them, like, I don't even know what he was saying, because honestly, I was just too, like, like, wired, I guess, mm -hmm. so I told him to take a few steps back, I was like, you're too close, you need to step back, and he was like, don't tell me what to do, and I just kind of just stood there, and then... My uncle kind of moved out of the way, and then my mom kind of went past him and into, like, the big room okay. where everything happened, and so I walked with them, and then I... So they were more in the hallway. Yeah, they were at, like, the end of the hallway, okay. basically, and so my mom walked all the way around, and he kind of followed them, and I just kind of stood. My uncle was, like, right here, and then my stepdad right here, and then me and my mom were kind of right here. I didn't do anything with the base on that. I kind of just held it there, and he was getting really close to my mom, so I kind of stuck it out, like, between them, and they were both just yelling, and he was like, if you hit me with that baseball bat, you're going to go to jail, and I just kind of stood there with the baseball bat, and I just, I didn't really say anything. When you said they were yelling, who was yelling? My, it was mostly my stepdad. Okay. Well, he was really the only one, like, yelling. Mm -hmm. My mom was kind of like responding mm -hmm. but i honestly couldn't tell you what they were saying it was okay. kind of just like all jumbled up in my head 
And so I just kind of stuck the baseball bat out there, and then he, like, he just grabbed it and tried to take it. So I held on to the end, and then eventually I fell, and he kind of took it into his hands like he was going to do something with it, and that's when... So when you fell, he ended up with the bat? Yeah. Okay. And so I fell to the ground, and then my uncle kind of, like, I saw him take a step back, so I'm, my uncle, I think, grabbed him and kind of took him back so he couldn't, like, do anything. You saw your stepdad, so like, take a step take back? Take a step back, because he was really close okay. to begin with, and then I kind of, and so my mom said to go with JJ, and so I ran out the door, and then I kind of just stood there with my little brother. Just He was in the front seat of the car, and so I just kind of opened the door and just stood there, and, like, he was trying to get out. And I was like, no, we have to stay. We have to stay in. And I was like, oh, like, do you... I was, well, I told him, like, do you want to go in the Jeep? And then he was like, no. And then I realized that my car was blocked in, so I couldn't anyways. I was like, okay, like, just stay here. And then eventually my mom came out mm -hmm. and then we left from there to kind of back up a little bit so you had talked about um your stepdad when you put the bat out your stepdad mm -hmm. was coming towards your mom mm -hmm. can you describe to me a little bit better kind of what was going on there like is um, there a reason you put the bat up yeah he was walking mm -hmm. towards my mom and i just didn't want him to do anything, so I kind of just stuck out the bat. Like, my mom was right beside me, and he was right there, so it wasn't, like, between them. Okay. It was kind of just, like, I just stuck it out to be, like, keep your distance, kind okay. of. When you say you didn't want him to do anything, what did you think he was going to do? Hit her. Okay. Yeah, it's, for the most part, been pretty, like, mundane but there have been a few like violent times with him when I was really scared that he was gonna hit me or hit my mom like okay. just because everything was kind of crazy me and him have always kind of not gotten along mm -hmm. like just since I was little and so there have been a few times that we've gotten in fights and stuff like that and so I don't yeah so I'm just kind of always scared of that yeah yeah and then um, so that happened, and he, he grabbed the bat from you. Mm -hmm. So kind of tell me that again real quick. So I kind of stuck it out, and this is when he was like, if you hit me with that base bat, you're going to jail, and I didn't say anything because I'm like, okay. And he, so I'm holding it by, like, the end of the bat, like yeah. the place where you hold it, and so he kind of took it, and I kind of, like, lunged forward and kind of lost, like, my footing. Mm -hmm. And so my mom was like... Just let go, and so, um, yeah, I kind of, like, slipped and I fell, mm -hmm. kind of on, like, my side. Okay. Yeah, and then from that, my mom said to go to the car, so I just got up and ran out the door. Mm, Tylee Ryan, uh, in her own words, a few months before her death, um, her mother is accused of murder, um, accomplished to murder for her own daughter's death, for Tylee's death, but she's also accused of being an accomplice to murder in this case in Arizona for the stepfather um, that she was talking about. That was Lori Vallow's husband, Charles Vallow. She's facing murder charges in that one. And Dave Ehrenberg, uh, Kim Benjamin, Dave Ehrenberg's still with us. Dave Ehrenberg, this seems like it actually will help Lori Vallow, um, her daughter, who she's accused of also you know, murdering uh, or being involved with her murder, what Tylee is saying, though, kind of helps Lori's story, does it not? And um, from the grave, it would be ironic, but this could be played in front of a jury and um, in this separate case. It might help mom. Yeah, it could. That's the first time I've seen uh, anything that would show that the death of Charles Valla was indeed a self-defense case because the police ruled a self-defense and then they closed the matter. They didn't have the benefit of looking at that death in the context of all the other deaths that were going on and all the crazy behavior from the doomsday cult. And so they closed it out. But that's the first evidence I've seen that would justify the police to declare this self-defense. Now, I think otherwise, because I have the benefit of looking at it in the context of all the other deaths. But you can see how that would be quite persuasive testimony. Yeah, I mean, from uh, the from the um, other view, it's like, ah, she was coached by mom to say these things about the bat. Here's Lori Vallow talking that same day about 
Charles, she says he was going berserk. He goes nuts. He's gone nuts on us a lot of times. Ted and I have had to leave with JJ over the years, probably five times, and just stay in a hotel for two days because he goes nuts. Like, you don't know what's going to set him off. Like, whatever. And she's mad at me for always, like, going back. But we had JJ, and he's special needs, and it's really hard. Like, yeah. it's even harder to get her by yourself. So when you say he goes nuts, that means, that can mean a lot of different things. Right. So, goes nuts like yelling and screaming. Yeah, goes yelling nuts and like screaming. Goes nuts like breaking like, things. Yes. Goes nuts like physical violence. He's never really, besides like grabbing us or pushing us, but not like punching okay. us or something. But he, with Tylee, he has gotten physical okay. before. And with my grown son. Kim Benjamin, this is a, such a convoluted case uh, that uh, our viewers are into it because they, they know all the details. Uh, a jury, though, in, in um, Arizona for just the death of Charles Vallow um, may or may not get all of the other parts of this, likely won't get it all. Um, when you look at both of these interviews, what, what are your thoughts in terms of if, it, if it, at the end of the day these are going to help the state or maybe help the defendants, the defendant, Lori Vallow. I think that at the end of the day, the videos do help the defendant in that case, because especially with the young girl, because she is not necessarily there to help her mom. It doesn't appear she was coached. In fact, she talks about, I needed a bat to feel safe. I mean, what child talks like that? She said, I'm too young for pepper spray. I mean, she clearly did not feel safe in her own home. And she was telling a very detailed, descriptive story uh, without a lot of leading. The person who was interviewing her was asking general open-ended questions and giving her a chance to tell her story. And it's the sign of a good interview when the person being interviewed is doing most of the talking. So in both of those interviews, you saw... Uh, people telling what can lead to a very good self-defense case if the jury gets to hear both videos and uh, and not have the outside cases and the other cases interfere with their ability to make their decision. Yeah, it's just heartbreaking to see her um, in that interview knowing what happened to her eventually just a few months later. The fascinating case that will continue, of course, to follow. Still ahead, the trial of the men accused of chasing and killing 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery is approaching. What to expect coming up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. In just a few weeks, the three men facing charges for the death of Ahmad Arbery will go on trial in Brunswick, Georgia. Travis McMichael, his father Greg, and their neighbor William Roddy Bryan face murder charges for chasing down Arbery after seeing him running in their neighborhood. Leading up to the trial, attorneys for the defendants have attempted to introduce evidence of Arbery's past, including medical records and prior arrests, but the judge ultimately ruled against the motion saying no, those items will not be coming in. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Jade has more on the upcoming trial. The following video includes graphic content. Viewer discretion is advised. Anytime you pursue the young man, you go jump in a truck with shotguns and follow him and, and and, and slaughter him like that, that's, that's lynching. Ahmaud Arbery's father isn't the only one who thinks his son was the victim of racial terror. It's heartbreaking. It's, it's 2020. And this was a lynching of an African-American man. Lynchings recall a dark chapter in American history, typically that of white mobs terrorizing black citizens. Historically, yes, lynching has been, many people think, exclusively hanging, but it wasn't just that. Rachel Rollins, the district attorney of Suffolk County, Massachusetts, and others say lynchings still plague America, not always with rope and trees, but with the same bias-motivated mob mentality. I think it's important that we start using um, words that make people uncomfortable. Upwards of 5,000 people, mostly African Americans, are believed to have been victims of lynchings between 1882 and 1968. It never stopped. Emory University professor Hank Klibanoff teaches a course called the Georgia Civil Rights Cold Cases Project. It examines racially motivated murders, including potential lynchings. What if we didn't have a video of the Arbery case? I mean, I don't think we'd be talking about him now. 
Efforts to define the crime of lynching date back to the early 20th century. Probably the, the clearest definition came from the Tuskegee Institute, which for decades and decades was the arbiter of what's a lynching and what isn't. One, there must be a dead body. Two, death must have come through illegal methods. Three, at least three persons must have been involved. And four, it must have been done under pretext of service to justice, race, or tradition. In this definition, some see clear parallels with Arbery's death, even though there's no modern day consensus on what exactly constitutes a lynching. Arbery's accused killers, Gregory and Travis McMichael, said they pursued Arbery because they thought he was a burglary suspect and acted in self-defense. Family denies the incident was racially motivated. Rollin says Arbery's death resembles a lynching in more ways than one. She points to the 74 days that passed before the arrest of the McMichaels, and this only after cell phone video went viral. Not just the horrific violence of a lynching that Ahmad's mother has to handle, she now has to look at not one, not two, but three district attorney's offices that did nothing. Two prosecutors stepped back from the case because of ties to the suspect, Greg McMichael, and a third DA was accused of not acting fast enough. All efforts to introduce federal anti-lynching bills have failed over the years, especially during the height of racial terror. Now, a new federal proposal named for one of the country's most infamous lynchings is gaining traction. The Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act defines lynching as a conspiracy to commit a hate crime. It would add lynching to the federal civil rights law. It pains me when I hear people say, I don't want to hear about that history. Well, the only way that we are going to be able uh, to shift our society is we have to examine the unexamined, face the tragedy, and decide that we won't fall into despair, but we're going to move forward into a new future. Hmm. Jury selection in the Aubrey case begins October 18th. Court TV will have gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. Recently, the family of Ahmad Arbery spoke with our Julia Janae for an exclusive interview. Here's a preview. And let's talk about Ahmad as a little boy. Marcus, what do you want people to know about him and his childhood? That he just, his heart was big in life. And uh, he loved his family. You know, if you know him, you understand him, because the things he did for his family and the ones he cared about, you know he cared about you. You know, he always wanted to see everybody happy all the time. You know, it wasn't never a dull moment when he was around because he just wasn't that tight to have a dull moment. He always, now you sitting around like something wrong, he coming out like, what's wrong? Why y'all sitting there and everybody quiet? You, he the type wanna, he the type wanna, wanna do something. He'll say, well, let's, chip some dogs in, get some meat and put it on the grill. That's just how he was. He just wasn't no dog moment when he was around. He just was lovable. And you can watch Julia Janae's full exclusive interview. You don't want to miss this. This is the uh, first time the entire family gets together and speaks. It's the Aubrey Family Speaks tomorrow night right here on Court TV, 7 p.m., 6 p.m. Central. Still ahead, the national manhunt for Gabby Petito's fiance, Brian Laundrie, has investigators looking in Florida, Tennessee, across the country. Everybody's looking for him. Details on that next. Stay with us. Welcome back to Court TV Live. We are monitoring that courtroom in Tennessee where Jeffrey Paschal's defense begins as soon as the judge takes the bench and the jury's in the courtroom. Of course, we'll get you in for that live testimony. We're anticipating the possibility that the defendant will take the stand in his own defense. Meanwhile, police are adding more manpower to the search for Brian Laundrie, not just police, it's the FBI, law enforcement from uh, across the country and specifically in Florida. In Sarasota County, they're now looking for laundry. Uh, they're continuing to look for him in the Carlton Reserve in Venice, Florida. A family lawyer for the laundry family told CNN that there's communication between them and authorities, 
but that he couldn't comment on any potential development. Laundrie's fiance, Gabby Petito, was found dead last month in Wyoming. Prior to the finding of her remains, the couple had taken a cross-country van trip. We all know this story. And uh, Brian Laundrie came home alone. Gabby Petito's family had to call um, authorities and, and report her missing um, in September, 10 days after Brian Laundrie returned without his fiance with her van in Florida. Uh, it's a case that has grabbed the country's attention and people are looking for this individual still with us, state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida, Dave Ehrenberg, who is very well aware of what's going on in this case. And Dave, for people that are thinking, oh, why are they keep looking at this Carlton Reserve? He's probably somewhere else. Um, that's only one of the many places and many leads that is going on behind the scenes, is it not, um, in terms of what law enforcement here is doing to try to locate, find out if he's dead or not, and then find out, find him if he is alive, or either way. Yeah, Ted, there was an unusual police presence in the reserve yesterday, more than they've had in recent weeks. And I think it's because there was a report that they found a campsite there, and they thought that was perhaps where Brian had camped out. They were going to ask the parents to help them locate where Brian's favorite camping places were in that preserve. But when they found evidence of that campsite on their own, the parents did not get involved. And the parents have said now that they will try to assist in the search for their son. But it's hard to believe anything that comes from them at this point, because remember, they never reported Gabby missing, not once. They never agreed to help in the search for Gabby. They never responded to Gabby's parents' desperate request for help. And after Brian went missing, they didn't report him missing until several days after he was gone. So you have to wonder what to believe from them. Gabby Petito's parents were on Dr. Phil, and they said that they text um, uh, Laundry's parents and said, hey, we're going to report our daughter missing, and um, we're, you know, the police are going to be involved here. I would like to talk to you. And um, crickets, take a listen. One of the texts, I mean, I, we're going to call the, the police, right, you know, just letting you know, because we have no idea, no responses. No, a normal parent, when you text someone that they're going to call the cops because you can't find your child, they would reply. Nothing. No response, no nothing. Here, a prosecutor. What, I mean, the, the what if, and we, they haven't done anything wrong yet that, you know, we know about publicly, but if they did have anything to do with helping their son go on the run. Um, where does it become illegal? Is it lying about it to authorities? Where is that line? Well, lying would be a separate crime. If you lie to the feds, that's a major crime, punishable by up to five years in prison. Ask Martha Stewart. That's what got her imprisoned. If you lie to a state investigator, you can be charged with obstruction of an investigation. But I think the crime that they could face if they were involved in helping Brian escape would be accessory after the fact. Now, to be charged under that, you have to first know that Brian committed a crime, and second, you have to do something to help him avoid arrest or punishment. It's not enough to remain silent. It's not enough to lawyer up. They would have to do something like sanitize the van or destroy evidence or buy him a plane ticket to get out of town if they knew that he had committed a crime. And so we don't know enough yet whether they will be charged, but at, at the very least, there sure are incriminating themselves in the court of public opinion. Oh yeah, uh, there's frustration. You know, you look Gabby Petito's family, uh, you know, the, imagine the anger that they had that they weren't getting cooperation from his parents during this after they'd spent so much time, these two together. Um, uh, and then you're right, the court of public opinion is irate. The public is also on alert. He's been seen maybe in Canada. He's been seen across. People are on TikTok investigating this. Uh, one individual who's getting some traction is someone who says that he believes 99% that he encountered Brian Laundry uh, along the Appalachian Trail, Tennessee, North Carolina area. His name's Dennis Davis. He talked to Vinny Politan about that. Take a listen. And then he turned around and looked at me and he said, man, I'm lost. And I said, well, I'm not from around here, but maybe I can help you. Where are you trying to get to? And he said, I'm trying to go to California. 
And, um, I, you know, I was thinking to myself, wow, well, that I wasn't expecting that. And, uh, and then he went on and said, he said, um, my girlfriend and I got in a fight and she called me and she told me she loves me and I've got to get to California. I told him, well, I, I-40 is right there. I mean, we were just a half a mile off of I-40. I said, you can get on I-40 and take that west and go all the way to California. And he said, no, I'm going to stay on this road. And the, the road that we were on was just a small two-lane country road. He said, I'm going to stay on that, this road and take it to California. Dave, the public in a case like this helps because eventually they can help find him. But also, boy, it can take people the wrong way if uh, you're getting leads coming in fast and furious. How do they? How does law, law enforcement and investigators and you're when you're looking to prosecute? How do you manage all that? Well, the investigators are dealing with it right now. The prosecutors are trying to develop evidence to charge him, and the prosecutors' burden is higher than investigators. When police want to make an arrest, they just need to make an arrest based on probable cause. But for prosecutors, you have to develop enough evidence to think you can get a conviction beyond any reasonable doubt. So police can follow leads, but they are trained into knowing which leads have the bare essentials of credibility to pursue it. Like if someone said, yeah, I saw him uh, in the south of France on a, on a boat, you know, that would probably not be very credible. But a hiker in the Appalachian Trail, which is consistent with Brian's behavior of loving to hike and to camp, well, that would be someone who may have more credibility. So that's why I'm not surprised that they're looking up there. And then also, Ted, you've got Dog the Bounty Hunter out there trying to sniff out his scent. So you've got all these people who are trying to help law enforcement. And I think overall it's a good thing, but you're right, on the other side, mm. if you have bad tips, it can take them off the track. Yeah, Dave Ehrenberg, thanks for your expertise. Really appreciate your time this morning. We're gonna step aside, take a break. Be right back after this, Stay Top of the hour, welcome back. Testimony set to resume at any moment in Tennessee versus Jeffrey Paschal. The former reality TV star is accused in a brutal attack on his girlfriend in 2019. The defense will have its turn to call witnesses when court resumes in just a few minutes here. We're expecting um, the judge to take the bench at any moment, and as soon as he does, uh, we will get you into the courtroom. The big question, will this man take the stand in his own defense? The state rested its case in chief after calling just three witnesses yesterday, but they were powerful. The jury heard from the victim, Kristen Chapman. Take a listen. Uh, you said you all had dinner and drinks. What were you yes. drinking? Champagne. Do you recall how much you had to drink? I recall that I had three glasses of champagne. Who was driving that night? I drove. Okay. And um, did Mr. Paschal have anything to drink? Yes. And what do you recall what he was drinking? Double whiskey and Cokes. Okay. And so when you get back in the house, you said, um, tell us exactly what you remember as soon as you get back into the house after walking the dog. After coming up my driveway, the next thing I remember, I was on the floor in front of my staircase that leads to the upstairs. And he had um, me by the back of my head and was hitting my face into the floor. And I was screaming for him to stop. Okay. Um, is that is that all that happened or no um, from there he um, dragged me up the stairs um, it's not quite a split level but it's, there's like four stairs that lead up to the bedroom and it's hardwood floors and he was dragging me by my head and by my hair he had me um, kind of by the back of the neck and we went um, up the stairs towards the bedrooms and I blacked out again. I lost consciousness. And so after the uh, physical attack stopped, what happened? Um, so I remember being, I remember going up the stairs and then that's the last thing I remember. Um, I don't know what happened up there, but there was blood splatter down my bedroom door. So something happened up there. The next thing I remember, I was in the corner of my kitchen um, and he was shoving me up against the wall and then he got me back down on the floor in the kitchen and was hitting my head on the floor in the kitchen and I lost consciousness again. The next thing I remember, um, when I regained consciousness, I was sitting on my couch um, in my living room and I was looking at 
a wall. They've got front windows and then there's a wall next to it and there was blood splattered down the wall. I don't even remember being against that wall or in the, it was in a corner that I don't remember being in, but um, I was sitting on the couch and my face was um, dripping blood down my chin and onto my couch. Um, and he was pacing, not saying anything, but just pacing behind the other end of my sectional, which had been overturned, flipped upside down. Did you have a cell phone or anything at this point? Um, I did own a cell phone. Um, I didn't know where it was during this whole situation. Um, when I laid down in bed, he had my phone and he also had um, his MacBook. He also had his computer. Um, and he sat on the other edge of the bed on the opposite side um, and I was pretending to sleep and trying not to lose consciousness. I was really focused on staying conscious because I, I knew I had to get away at some point um, or I didn't know what was going to happen. So I kept kind of opening my eyes a little bit to look and see what he was doing. Um, and he had my phone. He was in my messages. I saw him in my social media accounts, especially my messages of my social media accounts. Um, he had deleted a bunch of voicemails once I finally got my phone turned back on. It's essentially like he erased every trace of him through my phone. I've read. All right, uh, testimony yesterday, Kim Chapman, um, uh, Kristen Chapman on the phone. Kim Benjamin is with us from Kansas City, Missouri. She's still with us. And joining our discussion, Deputy Public Defender for Los Angeles County, Philip Dubé. Good morning to you. Good early morning, Philip, up early in L.A. Um, this witness was riveting, and her story seems awful believable to me but i'm not in that courtroom um i don't you know just your overall philip we'll start with you um your, your overall impression on what you just heard what the jury heard yesterday um in terms of this witness's credibility well she comes off quite credible let's be honest here you know uh, anytime you have a woman taking the stand describing what her oppressor her attacker did to her it's riveting it's gripping uh, what I would do on cross-examination, and I've had success at it, and I've also gone down in flames on it, quite frankly, but sometimes you got to take risks if you got nothing to lose. I'd have her step down from the witness stand and do a demonstration with counsel. So, for example, she said she was grabbed by the back of the neck and then by the hair and dragged up the stairs. Uh, in order for the jury to have some type of reasonable doubt, uh, the defense is going to have to show, uh, first of all, why would she lie, number one? Can you point to a good reason or a motive for her to want to make this up? And uh, number two, did she in fact have injury? And if she did, are the injuries consistent with her description of how they occurred? You know, by all accounts, this lady's face and head was slammed into walls, slammed into the grounds. But it's my understanding that the photos of the injury are not really reflective of how she has described this. The reason how or well, why... Look at that, that photo, been... Philip. No, no, but does, is that fair enough? And I'm not going to trivialize her injuries. But let's be honest. There's a difference between felony injury and misdemeanor conduct. And if a jury comes back guilty on the misdemeanor, from a defense standpoint, you can live with that because his prison or jail exposure is far less. Um, seriously, the way she described what occurred to her, you would expect her to be bruised and swollen from head to toe, to be dragged upstairs like that by the hair, like a caveman just pulling on her, very savage, like you would expect to see more injury on her. And with the blood dripping, maybe a, a more of a cut. Kim, the, um, this is a pivotal time in this trial, obviously, where the defense has an opportunity to pr present a case. Um, it, does that mean, to your point last hour and Phillips just now, saying if there's anything that can establish a motive for her to make this up and, and, or, or embellish um, how do you get that out, and um, is that what you would be concentrating on if there is something there, whether it's a, another witness, someone who witnessed or heard um, them at one point, something? Do you need something other than just the defendant? 
you don't necessarily need something more than the defendant, but you definitely need a believable explanation as to what happened. For example, his explanation could be that she was mad at him and that she uh, attacked him and that he was defending himself. That could be a story that he tries to tell. And then the question is, is it a believable story? Um, she mentions that he was going through her phone. It sounds like there'd been drinking and maybe some jealousy going on. There could be some explanations that he is probably the sole person who could bring out unless the defense attorney has some really good uh, cross-examination of her, which uh, I guess if the state rested yesterday, we haven't seen that video yet. Um, but some way to show that what has happened here isn't necessarily him attacking her or that she um, embellished or that there's something more going on, uh, like like the motive to lie. And it could be that he's the only source of that information. Yeah. Well, ask and you shall receive. You would like a little cross-examination. How about a little right now? This happened yesterday. Um, and the first question was to the to Kristen Chapman. Did you uh, did you or did you not trip when you were coming into the house because of uh, all the alcohol, the champagne that you ingested? Take a listen. Do you recall ever falling? I remember being pushed down. Yes, pushed. falling onto did the ground from being pushed. Falling or stumbling into a doorway? No. Is it okay? Do you ever recall stumbling as you exited your residence? No, I did not stumble on the way out okay. the door. And also, last time we, we talked, I asked if, if you were drinking Tito's and vodka at the brasserie in addition to the champagne and the wine, and you said you didn't recall. I do not recall drinking anything other than champagne that evening. But it's possible? No. I only recall drinking champagne that evening. Okay. There's a little window into it. The judge apparently is on the bench. Let's take you in live now into the courtroom. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, for the record, yesterday uh, we were talking about the pictures from uh, inside the home, and I accidentally numbered two of these exhibits as 45. Uh, one was marked for ID only. Uh, it was a, basically a duplicate picture of alleged blood spatter on the tile. And then uh, there was another 45 that was received into evidence. It's what appears to be blood at the, I think that was at the bottom of the kitchen wall. Uh, so the one that's marked for ID only, I'm going to remark that as 45A. I just wanted to clarify that on the record. And then what number will the redacted disk be? Okay, that'll be 60 received into evidence. Uh, we ready to take a moment? Uh, we are, and uh, Your Honor, there was a, based on one of our prior evidentiary hearings, uh, the court instructed uh, counsel to uh, notify the court if they, if we intended to go into text messages. Um, Mr. Paschal will take the stand this morning, and I anticipate that we will get into the text messages that were the subject of our uh, previous previous hearing. Okay. Is there anything we need to take up at this point regarding those? Well, Judge, I think the court, the, the argument from the state's perspective, the last time we were here and we filed a motion seeking to exclude those, uh, is that quite frankly they can't authenticate them. These are just screenshots with a name at the top. There's no information. Some of them don't even have the full date on it. Um, if the defendant is going to. I assume allege that these messages came from the victim after the fact, um, but however, like I said, there, there's nothing, it's just screenshots, and we don't have anything to authenticate them. I, the state did not receive these messages until I think we were like a few days before we were set for trial last time. 
and that's why we filed a motion to exclude it. And I think the court had ruled last time that um, authentication, you know, was an issue just because just because the defendant says that it is what it is, you know, that sort of thing. And so we didn't know. Well, you'd agree, we're going to have a jury out hearing before they'd be admitted, correct? That's what we're, we're right. I, okay, so why don't we have, are you going to authenticate them through Mr. Yeah, Jackson? Yes, and they are dated, and the reason we continued this was for the state to conduct a forensic evaluation, and that evaluation did not indicate uh, that these were not uh, true and accurate screenshots of Mr. Michelle's phone. All right, well, we're here for a proffer, so with, let me hear the proffer first, and then you all can make any argument about authentication. You so like to call when, would, when would the court prefer that we, we do that in terms of timing? Well, you, we, do you have other witnesses other than Mr. Passman? No, sir. Let's do it now then. Okay. All right. May I approach and have this marked? Yes. Will he be taking the stand? Yes. Okay. For the profit? Yes. Okay. Mr. Passman, sir, if you please come to the witness stand. Sir, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Okay. Thank you. Please have a seat. State your name for the court. Jeffrey Paschal. And Mr. Paschal, uh, you've been in the courtroom today. Uh, you've heard the testimony from Ms. Wilson Chapman, correct? That's correct. And during the relevant time period from June 9th of 2019 to some months forward, did you in fact have a smartphone? I did. And tell the court what make and model of smartphone that you had. I had an iPhone um, during that time, I think it was an iPhone 8 possibly. Now, after the evening of June 9th, 2019, did you receive any text messages from Kristen Wilson Chapman? I did. May I approach? May I? Mr. Paschal, let me show you what has been marked as Exhibit 61 and ask if you can take a moment to review that document. And if the court would like a copy of the exhibit, what would it And Mr. Paschal, if you'll tell me when you're finished reviewing I'm finished. Exhibit 61. Yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> And can you tell the court what is depicted in Exhibit 61? Uh, there are text messages between us. Um, when you say us, uh, uh, tell the court who us in, entails. There, there are text messages in between uh, Kristen Wilson Chapman uh, from the time of when we, prior to the incident onwards after all the way up to December 22nd of 2017. Or, and yes, the um, it says metabolic bone disease. That was when there was a squirrel at my house, and she had sent that to me concerning what was wrong with the squirrel. So that was when we were on good terms. So it encompassed a time period before June 9th to some time forward, correct? That's correct. And can you describe to the court what these pages represent? Uh, they represent text messages upwards of uh, two, three months, up to five months after the incident where she wishes me happy birthday at one point and tells me she wish misses me. Um, well, let's not go into the content right okay. now. How did you uh, obtain copies of the screenshots of your iPhone? I, t I, I physically screenshotted them. And okay, and specifically, um, when you have looked at, let's just say, page one, two, and three of Exhibit 61, uh, did you screenshot uh, these text messages contemporaneously when they were received? Uh, I did not, no. Okay. 
Um, when did you take screenshots of these messages? Um, sometime after the last one, preparing for um, court. So you basically searched your phone and, and looked to see if you'd had any communication from Ms. Wilson Chapman? Well, I, I knew they were there, but I, I, I looked at it and, and brought it up and screenshotted it and, and then sent them over. And let's look at page one of exhibit 61. And you referred to metabolic bone disease emergency treatment, henrysepets.com. Uh, who is that communication from? That was from Ms. Wilson Chapman. And can you tell from the screenshot when you received that text? Um, I, I cannot. I'm, I'm assuming it's around January 7th or June 7th of that year. Now, the above the metabolic bone disease text, there is a screenshot of an icon K. Underward, it says Kristen with three emojis. Um, female smiley face emoji with hearts, another one with hearts, uh, the other one uh, a couple with a time of 7.55. When did you receive that text message, if you know? No, the 7.55 is when I took the screenshot of the day I took them. Um, it says June, June 9, 2019 of seven, at 7.18 7 p.m. Yes. That's when she stopped, that's after the incident. And that's when she had stopped sharing location with me. She had been sharing location at that time. All right, there is a text that says, hi, happy belated birthday. It's been so long, I've really missed you. Uh, what is the date of that text? Uh, that is September 13th at uh, 2019 at 1021 AM. And who is that text from? That was from Miss Wilson Chapman. And my birthday is September 12th, so that was the day after my birthday. The next text is September 18th, 2019. Can you read that text in the record and tell the court from whom that text message is from? I really feel bad about everything, Jeffrey. I think things have gone, have just gone too far and I'm, I'm too deep in. I'm not sure how to make things right with you. Um, I had to get a new phone, by the way. That was in the same groupage of texts and that was September 18th. Um, at 1.23 p.m. of 2019 from Miss Wilson Chapman to me. The next text is somewhat cut off and it continues on the next page. Um, can you tell the court the date of the following text? That was the next day um, after the previous text on September 19th, 2019. And can you read it to the record what that text says? Was really looking forward to seeing you today. Who is that text from? That was from Miss Wilson Chapman. And can you put that in context for the court? Uh, I believe we had a hearing that day that was put off uh, for some reason. So we had a hearing where she was going to end up seeing me in court, I, I, I believe. Uh, the next text is dated September 29, 2019 at 11.02 p.m. Can you read that text and tell the court from whom that text is from? That's from Miss Wilson Chapman, and it says, hey, sorry for the late text. I've been thinking about you a lot. Okay, the next text, same day? Same day, same time frame. I feel like I'm just settling with everything. The next text is Tuesday, October 8th at 8.01. Can you read that text for the record? It's re really wish you wouldn't ignore me, and then an emoji of, of crying. Now. It looks like these texts are from Ms. Chapman, but I don't see a response. Did you respond to her text? Oh, absolutely not. And why not? Honestly, I, I, I thought I was being set up in some way. I was just, I didn't want to respond to it. Was there a pending order of protection or other? There was. Uh, Thursday, October 10th, can you read that text uh, into the record and tell the court from whom uh, it was received? Uh, this could have gone away. Over a month later, Sunday, November 17th, can you read that text into the record? You should have responded to me. This is your fault by acting like you're above me. I told you not to leave me. All you had to do was take care of me. 
This has blown up and now I can't stop it. In fact, I don't even want to now. I'll do everything I can for you to lose Caven. And who is that text from? It was from Miss Wilson Chapman. And who is Caven? Caven is, was at that time my four-year-old son. He's six now. Sunday, December 22nd at 936. Can you read that text message into the record? Got you now, exclamation point. You should have never messed with me. Who is that text from? That was from Miss Wilson Chapman to me. Uh, three days before Christmas, do you have any idea of the context of that text message? I, honestly, I don't. I don't know if there's court that time or not. I'm assuming not. Same date um, earlier in the day at 4.45 p.m., Sunday, December 22nd. Can you read those texts into the new little family in peace? It didn't have to be this way. You should have responded back to me. Good luck proving everything. B BTW, which is, by the way, exclamation point, with a happy face. Erase all the pics and texts, and I'll tell the truth, exclamation point. Who is that series of text messages from on December 22nd at 444 p.m.? They were from Miss Wilson Chapman from her phone to me. And these text messages start on June 8th and they are sporadic and they culminate on December 22nd. Did you receive any additional text messages after December 22nd? I have not, no. And Mr. Paschal, describe to the court how you took the screenshot of your phone to obtain these messages. Uh, I had it up on the screen. Uh, this is her name and the emojis. That's the one she put in in the very beginning. But I pushed the home button and the, I believe the power button at the same time, and it screenshots the picture. And uh, I did it for each of those. So I scrolled down, screenshot, scrolled down, screenshot, scrolled down, screenshot. And does Exhibit 61 truly and accurately reflect the texts that were received on your phone? Absolutely. I have nothing further. Thank you. All right, Mr. Paschal, you say that these um, purported text messages came from uh, Ms. Wilson Chapman, is that correct? That's correct. All right, I want to talk to you about um, some, some statements you've made and some civil depositions that you had in one of your custody cases in the months prior to this, to this incident, to June, okay? So on, let's see here, January 9th of 2019, so about six months, actually exactly six months before this incident took place, do you remember um, going and having a deposition in your uh, pending custody case against your ex-wife, Brittany? I, I did. I don't know if it was that time frame, but yes. Okay. Do you remember um, Robert White being there, the attorney, or Brandon White, I'm sorry, Brandon White, the attorney who represents your ex-wife? Yes. And Mr. White asked you at the time um, who Ms. Wilson was. You stated, Kristen, was it? We would object to her reading from the deposition. I think proper way would be in Rule 612 to use it as present recollection fresh. She can ask a question, he can admit or deny it, he denies it, she can show him a copy of his prior sworn testimony, but reading um, testimony from collateral ancillary proceedings uh, would not be admissible or appropriate. So we would object unless she uses it uh, in the appropriate way under the rules. Well, I don't know how she intends to use it, I don't know what it says. If it's a prior inconsistent statement from something that he said here during his testimony during the proffer, she could read it to him under those circumstances. Uh, but if not, she would need to follow the, the appropriate method for and, and I'm, and Judge, I wasn't reading verbatim. I'm just telling okay. him kind of what he said. <laughs> so. Well, it's the same, same principle. If, if it's a prior inconsistent statement, you can confront the witness with it directly. Uh, if it's not, if it's being used for some other purpose, the appropriate method would be to ask him the question and then go from there with the exhibit if necessary. 
Were you asked about Ms. Wilson at the deposition? Honestly, I, I, I don't remember. Would it refresh your recollection if you were able to see your deposition testimony? Yes. May I approach it? Highlight a portion here. There's more that I can read it and then look up whenever you're done. All these? Uh, yeah, you need to Okay, he's uh, reading over this deposition from another custody issue year uh, you know, before this incident took place. Um, what did he say? And were these text messages that were just introduced, tried to be introduced by the defense, legit? Where's the cell phone expert? Where's um, the validity here? The, a lot of uh, questions. Uh, to be answered here. Uh, Philip Dubé, what's your initial reaction to hearing all those text messages? Uh, well, first of all, he can lay the foundation for his own text. They're on his phone. He's familiar with them. They're writings that were going on between the two of them. But what, what it shows me But can't you fake is... that? I mean, can't you make that, you know, have your buddy um, somehow, I don't know, I feel like there should be a cell phone expert here. Well, then it goes to the weight of the evidence. If the jury decides they think he's, you know, a big put on and these are just fabricated, then so be it. But they don't really have any evidence to counter that from what I've seen. Well, I'll tell you what I have seen, if you were to believe these texts, is that she's not afraid of him. You know, if you don't have fear, then what are you left with? Maybe vengeance, retribution, you know, retaliation? As opposed to say, you know, you know, you should have, responded back to me, you'd think she'd say, you should have never put a hand on me. But you mm. don't see that anywhere. You know, this is what you get for harming a woman. You know, how dare you lay your hands or put your hands on a female? Now, no, it's in. instead, yeah. Um, I mean, if that's the, the true trans transcripts, then yes, he asked me. I don't, I don't recall that. It was two, three years ago, maybe. Okay, and after reading that, do you recall what your answer was? Um, if I knew Ms. Wilson? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, what did you state that your relationship with her was? I'm not, do you mind if I have a copy of that to refer to? Any Were you asked whether or not you knew Ms. Wilson? He, he asked me, who's Kristen? And, I and said, what was your response? Kristen was a friend. Okay. Um, let's go to the next page. And look at the, the top portion there. Um, and what did you state your relationship was with Ms. Wilson? Kristen was a friend on the prior page. Well, and continue on to the, to the next one. Did you say that she was your babysitter, actually? Uh, no, actually, I didn't. I said, did you meet her just as being a child care provider? I said, I met her. Yes, yes. Yeah, again, she can ask the question, show him the document, ask to refresh his recollection. If, if he can't, then I think that she is 
left with his answer, and those excerpts are not inconsistent statements that would otherwise make it admissible. So we would object to asking her to read, asking, say to asking Mr. Cashel to read a deposition in a custody case. That's sustained. It's not being offered an inconsistent statement of anything that he said during the direct portion of this proffer. So you can't just read in a prior sworn testimony. You have to rely upon his testimony from the witness stand. Well, do I need to get the paperwork back, I guess? Sure. I mean, unless you have another appropriate way to use it. Well, I mean, I'm trying to show credibility here. And if I could, you know, have five minutes to do that without an objection, I think that this stuff is going to show that six months prior to this, in a sworn deposition, this defendant stated that. Hold on. He objected. I sustained the objection. It was an appropriate objection. You're not doing this properly. So move on. And you can do anything you need to do during this proffer within the rules of evidence. OK. Did you also have a deposition on May the 17th of 2019? Honestly, ma'am, I don't recall. OK. Would it refresh your recollection if I showed you that, just so you can see the dates and stuff? Possibly. It shows me a date, yes. And does that appear to be the transfer between you and your ex-wife? Does it have your names on it? It has our names on it, but I can't authenticate it as a transfer. What day is that, ma'am? May 17th of 2019. It's about two weeks before this. Do you recall being asked to provide text messages between you and Ms. Wilson at that deposition? I don't recall, no. Again, would it refresh your recollection if you looked at your prior testimony? I mean, I'd be happy to look at it. Ms. Good, can you tell us the page number for purposes of record? Yes. So I'm looking at this would be page 108, starting at line 20. Just read that. I'm going to turn to the next page, and then we'll look up when you're done. After reading that, you were asked whether or not you had text messages between you and Ms. Wilson, correct? I mean, if that's what it says. Well, you just read it, Mr. Paschal. Is that what it said? Well, do you mind having me a copy so I can refer to it, I guess? After reading that, Mr. Paschal, does it refresh your recollection about the content of the testimony you gave in that deposition? Honestly, it really doesn't. It's three years old. Your Honor, at this point, I mean, if I need to call the attorney to get him to come in and testify about this, I can do that. I mean, I'm not really sure how else we want to do this. That likewise would not be admissible to have the attorney testify to hear say as to what? I'm saying to authenticate the deposition itself. I do not have a certified copy right here, right now. But if that's something I need to get, then I can certainly do that. And that's not the basis for our objection. We're making it under recollection refreshed, and it's not an inconsistent statement. It will be an inconsistent. There actually is an inconsistent statement in here, but he's not. With him saying that he keeps all these text messages, because two weeks before he told an attorney that he deletes all of his text messages almost daily. Well, if it's an inconsistent statement, like I said earlier, you can confront the witness with the inconsistent statement, so long as it was inconsistent with something that he said during the trial. All 
All right, so after reading that, just to be clear, your, your memory was not refreshed um, by reading your prior testimony, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I want you, you've got a copy of it up there, so I'm going to, if you don't mind, to look at it with me. Again, we're looking at page 108, beginning at line 20. You were asked, have you obtained your text messages with Kristen? Your answer, I think per the, when we spoke in here, I didn't have, keep those text messages. You were asked, have you since? You answer, no, we don't even text anymore. Is that what that says there? Yes. And that was two weeks prior to this incident, was it not? No, it wasn't. May 17th of 2019 was not two weeks prior to June the 9th of 2019. Uh, this is not from May 17th. This is from January. No, this one is from May 17th. I brought it up there and showed it to you. That, that excerpt you have right now is from May 17th. Okay, I just don't have any dates on it to know. There's no dates on it anywhere. Sir, well, can I have a copy of what you're showing? Sir, jump around. I, I need to see it. I've provided you multiple copies, but I will go print you another one and just not. All right, so you're right here. Can, can, I, can I see it before my clients ask about the document? What, what page one are you referring to? The, the highlighted portion. Your Honor, this deposition is dated May 17, 2019. These texts came in after June 9, 2019. This is, this, this is an inference that's not correct and it's false, and it's not relevant. This, this answer dealt with texts prior to this incident even happening. I, I strongly object to her creating an inappropriate inference in the record. What, for what purpose are you using this? Because literally two weeks prior to this incident, he told a civil attorney in a civil deposition he does not talk to Ms. Wilson anymore, he does not keep text messages with her, yet he's trying to now come in and say that he has screenshots purportedly with, with text messages before it, which, which nobody's ever seen, before the date. He said that there's a, a text message snippet at the top prior to June the 9th, yet he two weeks prior before this, he tells an attorney that he doesn't even speak with her anymore, that he does not keep his text messages with her, that he deletes text messages almost daily to save space on his phone, so and, and it goes to the authentication of these messages themselves. Okay, so are you using that to attack his credibility as a witness, in that you're saying he was lying about that then? No, Judge, I'm using it to say that, that it calls into question the authenticity of these text messages themselves that he's now trying to pass off. They happened five, six, eight, nine months after this deposition. They didn't exist yet. He can't deny it. She, she texted him after the fact. That was true, it, it, true on, in May of 2019. This is September 19, 2019. December 2019. There is no factual, legal, or logical nexus between that deposition and these text messages that came in a year later. How, how could he give an inconsistent statement with something that didn't exist? I strongly object to her use of this transcript because it's inappropriate and it's not consistent with the rules. Well, I think we are getting far afield of the limited scope of this proffer, which is whether these text messages will be authenticated and whether they're relevant and admissible. And, and Judge, also, Again, this is, this is kind of events leading up to this. Um, if, if I may just have a little bit of leeway here. Um, Mr. Pasha, do you remember on June the 4th um, sending a letter to your, having your attorney send a letter providing Mr. White with Ms. Wilson's phone number? Objection, June 4th of what year? 2019, so five days that before this. Before the allegations in this case, I object to relevance. I will listen to see how it relates to the authenticity. I mean, the jury's out. That's why we keep the jury out, so we can dig, dig into these issues. So let me see if the responses to this are relevant to the question that I had to determine. Do you recall your attorney sending Mr. White a letter following your depositions that provided, uh, were supposed to provide Ms. Wilson's phone number? I don't know what my attorney sent. No. Right. I approach, Judge. 
Your attorney is um, Paul Dill Dillard, right? If she could ask him to review the document that refreshes his recollection. It's just going to be that first page, really. Have you seen that letter before? No. You've never seen this letter before? Not to my recollection, no, not at all. So if your attorney, so if your attorney put in a motion, um, if he acknowledged that you had seen this letter before in his response to, to the state's motion. Answer, it's not appropriate under present recollection of fresh. Well, I need to hear her question first. Mr. Patrick, you have been participating with your attorney throughout this case, is that correct? Objection to attorney client communications. I did not ask. What you all talk about. Well, this is another attorney in another case. No, I'm talking okay, about Okay, guys. Uh-uh. Arguments come this way. You don't ask the question. What's your question? Uh, you've been participating with Mr. Isaacs throughout this process. Is that correct? Yes. Don't tell me anything you said, but this case has been pending for two years now, right? Yes. And we've had multiple motion hearings, multiple court dates. Is that correct? Yes. And you are aware um, that your attorney has filed motions on your behalf? Um, yes, of course. And you're, are you aware that your attorney has acknowledged this letter in a, in a, in a filing? Are we talking about Mr. Isaacs? Yes. I, I'm, I'm not aware. I don't, I don't know what he's done. OK. So you don't read anything that your attorney files? I don't know what he's acknowledged. Or, okay. uh, do you recall telling your attorney that Ms. Wilson asked you to give your civil attorney um, a false number? That's not my attorney in that paper. I don't have a, a Paul Dillard as an attorney. I'm sorry that... You don't, you're not represented by anybody at Mears and Dillard. I'm represented by Martha Mears, not Paul Dillard. I don't... Well, you would agree with me that, Ms., that p people in the same law firm um, can work on things interchangeably? I, I, I would not know that information. Okay. Judge, the, again, the reason I'm, I'm asking all of this is because, once again, five days prior, he provides a false phone number for Ms. Wilson in his civil deposition, or in, in his civil case. He provides a phone number that 100% is not Ms. Wilson's number, has never been Ms. Wilson's number. The defense has acknowledged that he did that in their filings, but state that Ms. Wilson asked him to do that. I mean, I don't, I'm not, that's just what I'm trying to get up for authenticity purposes, Judge. The proof's got to come from here, though. Okay. This is the witness that we have. So you can cross-examine him. Okay. Within the rules of evidence. Well, and Judge. You don't have to argue to me in the midst of your cross. Just cross the witness. Well, Judge, my, my point being, I think, if Mr. Bash is not going to acknowledge any sort of knowledge about any of this stuff, then I'm going to have to call other people to get it authenticated is kind of what I'm getting at. You know, you can call whoever you want, but right. this is your witness. We're not arguing. There's no objection. Just cross the Mr. Paschal, um, you and Ms. Wilson do not have children together. That is correct. Um, you would agree that there is a text message in here that says, um, hope you enjoy all your other kids. At least I get to enjoy my new little family in peace. Is that what one of the messages state? Um, I, I remember it. I don't see it at this very moment. December 22nd, no year. Of 2019. Um, yes, um, I see Well, it just right to be here. clear, there is no year on, these, on some of these. Is that correct? There's not. Okay, so some of them just have a date, but no year. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and then... Right above that, it says, I'll do everything I can for you to lose Kaven. Is that correct? Ab above that. Above is that text message from June 22nd, or December 22nd, I'm sorry. Well, about the family in peace, above that is a different text message. Do you see a message where you say, Ms. Wilson says, I'll do everything I can for you to lose Kaven? Yes, that was sent in November. That is not her child, is that right? That's correct. And... Um, we have been, this case has been pending for two and a half years, has it not? So, this this some, case, the criminal case. It was less than that, but somewhere around there, yes. Over two years. Yes. Is that right? We had multiple court dates um, down in Sessions Court. You remember going to those? I did. And we had, we've had multiple court dates in this court. You remember coming to those? 
I have. Uh, specifically, just since the case has been in criminal court, you were arraigned on this case January 17th of 2020. Yeah, possibly. Uh, you were back in court in July of 2020. Yes. Back in court on September 25th, 2020. If that's what the record states. I, I don't you know. did not provide these text messages until over a year after you say you received the first one. Is that correct? I provided everything to my lawyers. Whenever you got whatever you got, that's, I'm not in control of that. Okay. You would agree that, that um, the state did not have notice of these until September 29th of last year when we filed, when the motion was filed. Are you would, even aware of that? I would not be aware of that when, okay. you, when you got the messages. And um, these messages do not have a phone number on them whatsoever. They do not indicate anything other than Kristen. Is that right? That is correct. And do you have a, did you have a And um, so after, just briefly, um, you see the three little emojis after the name Kristen. Yes. Right? Uh, you kept her name saved in your phone that way after, after this incident. I so. never changed anything. She's the one that put those, that in there, in that name in there. Okay. And um, again, can you tell me why some of these don't have years on them? For instance, the one on October the 8th, no year. October 10th, no year. November 17th, no year. I, I can't tell you. I, I, I don't know how iPhone programming works. I, okay. I have no idea. But you would agree with me that there is no year on some of these. I mean, they flow into the, and from September, and it has a year, September has a year. On the same page of the text message, September 29th has a year, and then October, it doesn't have the year. But I can't tell you why it doesn't. And um, you never did, your phone was never forensically downloaded or anything like that, correct? This is the, the only thing you have is just these screenshots. I was, right? My phone had never been requested to be downloaded. Okay. Judge, I think that's all I have at this time. Correct. None. Okay. You may step down, sir. Any other proof in the proffer? Uh, not on behalf of Mr. Cash. Okay, any uh, proof from the state on the proffer? Yes. Okay. Ms. Wilson, or Ms. Chapman, come up here, please. We'll call uh, Kristen Chapman. Okay. Ms. Chapman's still under oath. Ms. Chapman, um, you've been sitting in the courtroom while we've been talking about these text messages, is that correct? Yes. And did you, in fact, text Jeffrey Paschal after the incident of June 9th? Absolutely not. And when um, did it come to your attention that, that I was in possession of these? Was that pretty recently? Yes, it was. It was only when you told me recently. And um, what did you do once you found out that Mr. Paschal um, was making an attempt to say that you had contacted him? I provided my phone um, that I had. I provided all the Verizon records that I had. I um, believe we asked to subpoena Verizon and Apple for my iCloud information to prove that I did not send these messages. Okay, and um, are you, so you, you did all of that voluntarily? Yes. Voluntarily, is that correct? correct. Mm -hmm. and, and that was after Mr. Paschal produced these uh, purported screenshots, is that right? Yes. Ms. Wilson, um, what is your phone number? My current phone number or the one that I had the at that time? The one you had at that time, I guess, yes. 585-749-7329. And are you aware of the fact um, that a different telephone number was provided in, for you and Mr. Um, in Mr. Paschal's civil case? Yes. Your Honor, I object that was in a, another case, hearsay, not relevant under 401. It's not said to make a fact of consequence more or less probable. That's the same information she tried to get in through Mr. Paschal that she couldn't do. I object. All right, your objection will be noted. We're jury out. I'll see where she's going with this. Are you aware that, uh, that a phone number was provided by Mr. Paschal that was supposed to be yours but was not? Yes. And were you actually contacted by that attorney um, because you, they had been given the wrong information eventually? Yes. 
I didn't ask what, what she was told or anything. I just asked her. And that entails a hearsay response, so I'll sustain the objection. Did you ever ask Mr. Cashel to provide um, his civil attorney with a, with a false phone number for you? No, I told him to give the correct phone number, and I was happy to talk to the attorney, because at that point we were on fine terms. And um, as far as these text messages, you've heard that some of them uh, purport to say that you're going to do everything in, in your power to lose his children. Did you hear that portion of it? I did hear that. Mm -hmm. Have you been subpoenaed in uh, Mr. Paschal's custody cases by Mr. Paschal? Yes. So Mr. Paschal actually has been, been the one to try and drag you into his own custody case, is that correct? Yes. And you do not have any children with Mr. Paschal? I do not. Have you, made, have you maintained contact with any of his children? No. And let's see, let's see the text messages themselves. Who marked? Oh, this would be the text messages. Who marked those Friday, didn't we? Hey, yeah, I think they were 61. Do you have those, Mr. Isaacs? I'm sorry? Do you have the uh, text exhibit for ID? Um, yeah, he does. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Wilson, I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit 61 for ID only. These are those text messages that we've been talking about. Did you send those text messages to Jeffrey Paschal? No. No, I did not. Have you contacted him in any way, shape, or form after June the 9th, 2019? No, I have not. Have you had anybody else contact him on your behalf? No. Uh, have you have you had any contact from Mr. Paschal? Uh, he drove by my house and dropped something off once, but we had no contact. No, okay. we didn't talk. And so um, it, it is your sworn testimony here today. You did not send these text messages. Correct. You provided your phone for a forensic download so that, that the parties could look for these text messages. Yes, correct? I did. Mm -hmm. um, you agreed to have your um, phone records subpoenaed, is that correct? Yes, I did. You agreed to have your iCloud subpoenaed, is that correct? Yes, I did. Okay. You made no objection when we asked you for those things? Correct. You did it willingly. That's all I have, Judge. Cross. Good morning, Ms. Chapman. Uh, State of Tennessee set out and they told you they were going to prove that these text message screenshots were fabricated, correct? That's what this lawyer told you, correct? Uh, Judge, I, I, should, I would object to that. I, you can ask the question. Okay. Are you talking about the forensic download? Yes. They asked if they could have my phone to forensically download to see if the messages were in fact sent from my phone. Well, there, there was a lot of information, a lot of things were sent, a lot of subpoenas were issued, correct? I don't know how many subpoenas were issued. Subpoenas were issued, correct? To Verizon and Apple, yes. Right, and actually the case was continued to determine whether there was a determination whether these were false, correct? They were trying to prove that those are false, yes. And the truth of the matter is, after the subpoenas, after the records, after all the forensic analysis, no one can prove anything other than what Mr. Paschal says is these came from you, correct? Those messages did not come from me. Where's the, where, where's the, where's the, the, the forensic information from the subpoenas to show anything other than an exercise in futility? I'm not sure. Nothing further. Can we read No. Okay. Ms. Chapman, sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal proof of defense. Just argument. Rebuttal proof of defense. Uh, the defense is the proponent of the evidence, so I'll allow them to argue their theory of admissibility. So go ahead. Uh, Your Honor, this is very simple and straightforward. The text um, have been identified, authenticated by Mr. Paschal as 
accurate. I think when the state, you can tell, put these texts under a Hubble microscope, we, everybody offered to do everything they can to make sure there was no ambiguity or no inappropriate inferences. And what we were left, or were left with this morning from the state is testimony with an oblique reference in a custody hearing that happened in May before this criminal case even occurred. I mean, it, it's pretty simple. Uh, taking a screenshot of your phone and your text uh, is common. Um, Mr. Paschal under oath said these were received. Um, they look like a text message that would be received. They are dated. If the state would look, there are years, and then after the same date text, some don't have years, which is, is consistent. Um, we cooperated with the state when they did the forensic analysis, and we're here. And this Kristen Wilson, Kristen Wilson Chapman says it didn't happen, because if she did, then obviously there would be significant implications that would involve a Class D felony. Um, so, you know, there's, there's bias and motivation on both sides. So, you know, the state's trying to say that they can't be authenticated. They have been authenticated. I think what the state can do is they can, in rebuttal, call whomever they want to uh, to attack these records if they want to. But I, I don't, the court asked us to bring this up and this was prior to the forensic analysis, I don't see any legal basis whatsoever to exclude these. Yeah. Well, Judge, the, the, I think Mr. Isaacs hits on a good point there. Um, as the court is aware, we have subpoenaed just about every record we possibly could with regards to Ms. Wilson's phone. And um, amazingly, these text messages were not found within any of those records either. Well. Okay, Judge, um, I apologize. I can tell the court now that these messages, which were not provided to the state until over a year after the first one was sent, some of them do not even have dates. Some of them are in no way, shape, or form relevant to this case. And, and quite frankly, Judge, if, if these text messages come in where he is talking about this custody battle, then I do believe that the state then should be allowed to ask him specifically about these statements that he's made in these custody battles, where he purports that he does not know Ms. Wilson, that he doesn't keep text messages with her, things like that. I don't believe they're relevant on a number of reasons, for a number of reasons. She never references the, the specific criminal case at all in the text messages. Um, again, these are just screenshots with the name Kristen. There's nothing to say what phone number they came from. Again, some of them don't even have years on them. And text messages and screenshots can be deleted. And so I, I do not believe that, this, that the defense has met the burden of authenticating these records. And, and we would ask the court to leave them out. But if the court does allow them in, I would just like some guidance on, on my cross-examination as far as his, uh, all these civil depositions and stuff that we have, where he makes completely contradictory statements, one about his relationship with Ms. Wilson, and among many other things. Okay. So. Thank you, General. Uh, well, the threshold for admissibility under an authentication standard is pretty low, and it's basically is there evidence in the record to support a finding by the trier of fact uh, that the evidence is what the proponent of the evidence says that it is. And uh, one of the ways that you can authenticate evidence is by calling a witness to say, this is what the evidence is. Uh, will there be questions as to how much weight the jury gives this testimony? Perhaps. It sounds like the state's going to cross-examine uh, the defendant on the, uh, the, the underlying credibility of this. And there might be other proof uh, related to that. I don't know. Uh, but I think the only question before me is the very low threshold bar of admissibility, and I think that that has been crossed in this instance. Um, that doesn't answer the entire question because the evidence would still have to be relevant and otherwise admissible. I do think that the statements that I see here uh, could be offered, uh, again, if they're accredited by the jury. And I want to make very clear by making this ruling, I'm not saying uh, that uh, the jury should or should not accredit 
uh, the, this evidence that's entirely within their province. Uh, but I do think that if it is accredited, it could be viewed as potential uh, uh, bias of the complaining witness uh, and therefore offer for a non-hearsay purpose. So for those reasons, I do believe after hearing this proffer uh, that Exhibit 61 will be admissible should Mr. Paschal decide to testify in the case. Uh, anything else we need to take up before a moment? Later on. All right, Mr. Paschal, sir, you're still under oath. Uh, Mr. Isaacs is going to have a discussion with you here on the record about your decision to testify, okay, sir? All right. Mr. Paschal, you are explaining to you your constitutional rights as it relates to this trial, correct? Okay. And you know there are a number of fundamental constitutional rights that you have. Um, you have the right to compulsory process, correct? Yeah. You have the right to a jury of your peers, correct? Uh, I've explained to you uh, that you have the absolute right for the presumption of innocence, correct? Yeah. I've explained to you that the state of Tennessee must prove each and every element of each and every offense beyond a reasonable doubt, correct? correct? I've also explained to you under the Fifth and Sixth Amendment, you never have to prove your innocence. You understand that? And you understand if you choose not to testify in this trial, that the judge will instruct the jury uh, not to create any inference that's negative uh, of guilt, etc if you choose not to testify. Do you understand that? Okay. Have I adequately and effectively explained to you your constitutional rights as it relates to whether we should put on a defense in your case? You know. Have we met and discussed those things strategically? We have. Have we met yesterday? We did. Have we met this morning? We did. After hearing the proof in this case, and reviewing the proof and the evidence in this case, and listening to mine and Mr. Ammon's explanation of your fundamental constitutional rights, you understand that you have the right not to testify, correct? Okay. Do you understand you have the right to testify? Okay. Would you tell Judge Hickson what your decision is? I wish to testify. Okay, thank you, Mr. Paschal. Let me ask you just a few follow-up questions. You can have a seat if you'd like. Uh, Mr. Patrick, you do understand you talk with your attorneys about this, you can take their advice, you can talk with your friends and family, but you do understand at the end of the day that this is your decision and your decision alone. Do you understand that? And this is your decision that you're making to testify in this case? Yes, sir. Did part of the discussions you had with your attorneys uh, deal with the advantages and disadvantages of you taking the stand? Specifically, of course, an advantage would be that you could tell the jury your side of the story. You understand that, of course. Uh, there are also other aspects, however, certain disadvantages to testifying. Are you aware if you testify, you'll be cross-examined by the prosecution? And are you also aware that depending on what your testimony is during your direct examination, it could uh, potentially expand the scope of things that they're allowed to ask you on cross-examination? You understand that? Specifically, yesterday afternoon, we had a discussion about certain uh, prior criminal convictions that you had on the record. Do you understand, as it stands now, the jury will not hear about those criminal convictions. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Do you understand that if you said certain things uh, during your direct examination, there's a potential that it could open the door for the jury hearing about those things. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Uh, you also understand uh, that if you said certain things about the alleged victim in this case, particularly uh, her character, uh, that could also open the door to certain aspects of your past and your character. Do you understand that, Mr. Passion? I understand that. Okay. And is it still your decision to testify in this case? It is. All right. Very well. Uh, anything else we need to take up before we bring the jury? No, you're wrong. So. All right. Let's get them lined up. Okay, you heard it. Judge is going to allow those text messages in, and the defendant will be taking the stand. Philip Dubay, your thoughts. Did the judge get it right? 
Absolutely, he did. The client can always authenticate his own texts on his phone. I think what a lot of people don't know is most cell phone carriers, and it's because of what I do. I can't tell you how often digital evidence is introduced at uh, jury trials, but most cell phone carriers do not store and maintain the contents of text messages beyond 30 to 90 days. They just don't have the cloud uh, storage space, if you will, to maintain all of that data cost effectively so it gets purged and it's no wonder that if a year later you're issuing a subpoena for this stuff that they tell you they don't have it or that it doesn't exist because it doesn't they just purge it automatically uh and as a uh, as a second point i very very rarely at least in california see a judge take a testimonial waiver from a defendant before deciding whether or not to testify unless he chooses not to. You only go through all these machinations and advisement if he's choosing not to. So there's no allegation later on appeal if convicted that he was never given the opportunity to testify and he chose not to. But here, you know, it seems like they're just warning him of the pitfalls to testify and he's uh, acceded to all those. So we'll see what happens. It's exciting. Yeah, <laughs> quite a turn of events uh, this morning um, uh, here in Tennessee. Would you, if you're prosecuting, which I know you don't do, um, yeah, that's okay. bring this the, the uh, victim back in a rebuttal case and have her get up there and say, I did not send these texts? 100% I would. Absolutely. But she's going to look like a liar, quite frankly. She's going to testify to that. More she than he, you don't think over. he looks like a liar? Possibly? Uh, no, because, well, he's producing something tangible. And by the way, just because he has those texts doesn't necessarily mean he's exonerated from domestic violence. All it really shows is that, you know, she might still have an ax to grind. She was very upset, but you can still be abused and upset. You know, the, the two are not necessarily uh, coextensive, if you will. So uh, I don't know. It could also backfire. But he is, he comes off very charming. I think he'll do well on the stand. He was lucky that his priors were excluded. And we'll see what happens. On another note, uh, this prosecutor needs to go back to her law school and ask for a refund because they didn't get the job done in teaching her how to lay a foundation. She doesn't know how to cross-examine a witness on authentication and foundation. And that's, uh, that's a big issue because, as you can see, our rules of evidence take on a life of their own when it comes to introducing this type of evidence at a criminal trial. And it looked like she was a fish out of water. Yeah, there was definitely uh, some heavy frustration. Judge is back on the bench. The jury has entered the courtroom. Here we go. The defendant about to take the stand in his own defense. They working? Okay, good. Uh, you can't? Can you hear me? Nothing? Really? Okay. Um, probably, mm. Yeah, make sure it's powered on. Ms. Vasala, could you come in here if you're next to your computer, please? How's this? Okay. Let's get my assistant in here and she can help it. My assistant's going to come in and make sure it's working, okay? All right. All right, a little technical glitch there. Not sure exactly what happened. It appears though a juror had a, some uh, question. Uh, and um, as you heard, the judge's assistant is going to come in to deal with said issue, providing a little bit more of a delay. Philip, uh, as we're here, uh, all parties have to be, especially the defendant, have uh, some butterflies right now. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? His life is on the line. This, I'm not exactly sure what these charges carry, but because we're in you know, felony land, he's looking at hard time for this. If the jury believes that he, in, in fact, inflicted these injuries the way she characterized them, he's going away. I mean, he's going to crash and burn, quite frankly. You know. On the other hand, if this attorney can get in a lesser included 
misdemeanor charge of domestic battery based on the, the, okay. the quantum of evidence to conform to the proof, that would be a tremendous defense victory. Anytime in felony land you can get oh, your client we'll cut you off, Phil, uh, uh, Cut you off, Philip. Judge talking. Let's go back in. Uh, but sometimes trials are just fluid things. There are a lot of moving parts. And we had some things that we had to take care of out of your uh, presence that came up unexpectedly. And uh, please don't hold that against the parties. Hold that against me. That was my fault, okay? So uh, uh, we are trying to be as respectful of your time as possible. I'm just very sorry that we got a later start than we intended to today. We are ready to go, however. The state uh, rested its case in chief at the end of the day yesterday. And at this point, if the defense chooses to, they are allowed to put on proof. So at this time, I recognize the defense for proof. Mr. Isaacs. Morning, Your Honor. Morning. At this point in time, the state calls Mr. Jeffrey Pichel. Sir, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you God? I do. Thank you. All right, Mr. Pichelle, make sure the microphone is pulled towards you so that the jury can hear you. Uh, state your name for the jury. My name is Jeffrey Paschal. And can you give the jury a brief rundown of your educational history? Yes, I um, attended the Pellissippi Community College, uh, received an associate's degree. Um, I then went to the University of Tennessee and received ecology and evolutionary biology degree. And then I uh, attended some graduate classes and received a communication studies uh, graduate degree. And can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and uh, about your family? I grew up uh, here in East Tennessee. Um, I went to William Blount High School and lived here pretty much all my life. And do you have children? I do. I have some Can wonderful kids. Tell us their, their names and their ages. Um, Paxton, my oldest, he, he just got married here in May, um, expecting a baby. Uh, she's around two and a half months pregnant with his wife, uh, Dakota, absolutely wonderful child, couldn't be prouder. He, uh, um, he goes to MTSU. Um, he's in uh, vocal performance. Um, I have uh, some young children that, um, um, Caven, uh, absolutely awesome child, um, and Crusoe. Crusoe is a wonderful child as well. Um, just great children. I, I, I could be prouder of my kids, to be honest with you. And can you tell the jury a little bit about your uh, employment history and background? Yes, uh, when I graduated high school, I tried to do the factory setting and uh, I didn't like that too much. I worked at Denso for a little while. I then um, started going to college um, and went through college and started, actually moved into construction and remodeling houses and rehabbing houses and I enjoy it. It's fun, I'm my own boss and um, make my own time and you actually stand back and look at the work and you're actually proud of it, you know? All right, you've been sitting here during the course of this trial. Tell the jury when you met and how you know Kristen uh, Wilson Chapman. I met Miss Wilson Chapman around December of 2017. Um, and we pretty much hit it off pretty quickly. Uh, and we started dating, um, enjoying each other. And so you met Miss Wilson Chapman in 2017. Uh, you began dating. Uh, did the relationship progress? It did. Um, we, we were lied at first, but you know our, our emotions took over, and we, we hit it off pretty quickly, and we um, pretty much were inseparable at that time after that. And would you describe to the jury kind of the, the interpersonal dynamics of the relationship with, with you and Kristen? Um, I mean, we had wonderful communication. She's educated as well. Um, she's nice to talk to. We have the same interests and hobbies. Uh, she likes to go hiking. I enjoy the outdoors, so we've gone hiking many times. She likes to travel. We've traveled uh, multiple times. Uh, we've camped, um, yard work, gardening. I mean, just the list goes on. She has her own house, and I'm good at handyman things, so I did everything I could in her house uh, to, you know, fix stuff that was broken or 
or that would potentially go broken or stuff like that. And did your relationship progress and become more serious and intimate as time passed? It did. Um, we, uh, we progressed from, you know, friends to girlfriend, boyfriend, and onwards up to um, engagement. Now, let me, you mentioned engagement. Uh, we've been talking a lot about June 9, 2019. Let me kind of rewind using that as a, the focal point to March. You mentioned you were engaged, so, so explain how that relationship dynamic changed that led you uh, and Kristen to become engaged. We really enjoyed each other, and it, it seemed like um, she was a good life partner for me, and I was a good life partner for her. Uh, we had the same interests, like I said, the same hobbies. We, we ate a little differently, um, but that just was a quirk in the relationship. It was, it was funny, it was cute, um, you know, stuff like that. They're, they're just small nuances that, were just, that made it a, a great relationship. Did you propose to her, or did she propose to you? I proposed to her. Now, fast forward to June 9th of 2019. Can you tell us what the state of the relationship was with yourself and Ms. Wilson Chapman at that point in time? At that point in time, our relationship was a little off. We, we, in any relationship, you have your ups and you have your downs. Um, at that time, I believe that we're we're actually we're a, kind of apart at that time, um, but we both had hopes that you know we were going to progress and and you know get things back on track. Now, would you say we were apart at that time? Did you all maintain separate residences, or did you cohabitate? We stayed the night at each other's houses. I mean, I had my own residence. I had my own animals. She had her own residence. I had my own. You know, she had her own animal. Um, so we we just floated you know, back and forth through each other's house um, when we were good. All right, let me draw your attention specifically to Saturday night, June 9th, 2019. Walk the jury through what happened that day. It was a normal Saturday. Um, she had actually called up her uh, brother's fiance worked at a nice local restaurant called the Brasserie, and she said, "Hey, we can go, you know, have a meal. You know, Katie. Her name's Katie Meyer. Katie can serve us. Um, she works there now. Um, Sounded like a great idea. Um, so I got done with what I had to get done with at my house. I head up, you know, went to her house. Uh, got there around 5:30. Um, she still needed a little time to get ready." So we left her house around 5.45-ish. I uh, got to the brasserie somewhere around 6 o'clock. Um, and of course, Katie Meyer was there, and she was our server. All right, um, you get to the brasserie around 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, describe to the jury what type of establishment the brasserie is. I actually had never been there before. Um, I believe she had been there in several occasions, but it's a high, higher class uh, kind of bar restaurant. Um, they put more emphasis, uh, I would say, on the bar aspect. It's a really pretty um, pretty place, a nice place, and I, uh, I had never been there before prior to that. All right, you're at the Brasserie uh, around 6 on a Saturday evening uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, did you all enjoy cocktails? We did. I mean, we, we went, and the first thing Katie did was I already had a drink for her. Um, of course, they're familiar with each other. I had met her a couple times prior. Um, so she gave her a drink, and I was like, I, I want a drink. And uh, she ended up bringing a drink to me as well, and it was, uh, it was fun. So we enjoyed, we enjoyed some drinks. Um, did, you eat, did, did you all eat dinner? I did. I ordered, um, ordered a burger and fries, which it's not something I normally eat, but um, just felt like letting myself go a little bit and, you know, having a good time with her. Did, um, did Ms. Wilson Chapman order a uh, dinner as well? She did not. No, she, um, I, I believe she had a little, sh some shrimp or something, um, but she nibbled on some of my french fries as well. 
All right, so walk us through. You're there. You're you're enjoying cocktails. Uh, you're eating an entree. How did the conversation go at the Brass Street? It was great. It was a lighthearted conversation. Uh, Katie came a lot and sat down and chatted with us. Uh, there were other people around that we spoke to. Um, random people, nobody that we knew per se. Um, we just had a good time. Very lighthearted and very. It just flowed well. Um, now, you're, you're there, um, you have an entree, uh, did you all continue to order cocktails as the conversation continued throughout the evening? We did. Um, it, was, it was pretty free-flowing. I mean, she, just, she would just bring them, um, you know, being, being her friend or her brother's fiance, I don't, I don't know what the relationship, that relationship's called, but brother's fiance, um, she would just she kept just bringing us drinks. How did you all travel to the brasserie? I arrived at her house. Uh, we ended up driving her car. So I drove her car to the brasserie. All right, you're, you're there. Um, you described the drinks as free flowing. How long did you all continue to um, share your entree and um, enjoy the cocktails? I mean, once the entree came, I, I ate it pretty quickly. But we were, we were there roughly about five hours um, at the restaurant. And like, a lot of it was talking. And I mean, we weren't gulping drinks down one after another. But we were just enjoying ourselves and having a lighthearted time. But you were drinking, or were you drinking consistently for five hours? When I say you, both Miss Wilson Chapman and yourself? Oh, yeah, we were, both of us. So you had a number of alcoholic beverages, correct? That's correct. And that was continuous for this period of approximately five hours, correct? That is correct. And were you both drinking at approximately the same pace? We were, yes. And do you recall what Miss Wilson Chapman was drinking that evening? Yeah, she, um she had a, a number of things actually. She had champagne, uh, she went to um, martini, and then she, her favorite is actually Tito's and um, soda water. So she had a lot of, several Tito's and soda water. And what were you drinking uh, on this occasion, Mr. Paschal? I, I had a uh, beer to begin with and then moved over to, two beers to begin with, then moved over to Jack and Coke. Now, during this, this stay at the, at the Brasserie, how would you characterize the conversation? It was great. It was lighthearted. It was like, it, it was, our conversation was like the drinks. It was just free-flowing. We had a good time. We enjoyed each other. Any argument? No. No. All right. What time did you, uh, you and uh, Ms. Wilson Chapman decide to leave? I, I believe the restaurant closed at 11, so I think that's why we kind of ushered ourselves out there, or we were probably ushered out. Um, so we left around 11 p.m. And who drove to Ms. Wilson's residence? She did at that time. I didn't think it was a good idea for either of us to drive, but she insisted, so I kind of relinquished. And how far is the Brasserie Bar and Grill from Ms. Wilson Chapman's residence? It's not very far. I'm, I'm gonna say three miles, so five minutes max. What happened when you arrived uh, at the house? Um, she had mentioned going to a, another place, which I was fine with. Uh, the, the other place was probably less than that, so maybe a, really three quarters of a mile away or a mile away from a house. Uh, so she needed to get ready. Um, spruce herself up. Uh, I ended up walking the dog, her dog, and um, that's when it all began. And up to this point, 11 o'clock, you're walking the dog, getting ready to go, have more drinks. How would you characterize the evening up until that point in time? Everything is great. There, there are no qualms, no issues, no problems. All right. What happened next? I walked the dog. Like I said, she was getting ready. and. The way that her, her uh, neighborhood is set up, her house is on a hill, but if you go up and over the hill, 
you can go down and there's a, um, a cul-de-sac. And so we, that was the dog walking area. So we'd walk and, you know, let her, let her go to the bathroom and then come back up. And we've done this countless, countless, countless times before. And uh, as I crested the hill, I called, like, as I said before, I have animals. So I called my son to check on um, our, my animals and um, which, you know, everything was fine. Um, got off the phone with him. He said he'd make sure everything, you know, cause my dogs have a habit of trying to escape the gate. Um, they've gotten really good at it actually, where they've okay, open it and slide through. So that was always an issue. Um, so I, I talked to him. Um, he said he would take care of it. I went to, you know, carried on and came to the house where she was. What happened next? She was apparently watching me, um, talking on the phone and it was at that time it went from zero to a hundred. Uh, it went from everything was absolutely great. Everything was absolutely fine to I'm communicating with another female. Can you describe to the jury Miss Wilson Chapman's demeanor when you entered the house from talking on the phone and walking the dog? It was very aggressive, very loud, um, very accusatory. Um, that was her demeanor when I came in. So change things, things changed dramatically. They did, they did. What happened next? I walked in um, and then she tore into me. Um, and at that time she was getting, in, she was loud, she was getting in my face, you know, I'd slowly push her back, um, just kept getting in my personal space, in a personal space. Um, scratch and slap, I mean, she was, she was doing things to me aggressively, but I don't think it was a, an attempt to be aggressive. I think she was just, she was upset, you know, thinking that I was actually talking to another female out there. And I guess we both had hopes that our relationship was going to progress from that night since we we're on the offs already. Um, Did the arguing and, and physical contact escalate? The arguing escalated. Um, the physical contact really didn't in a sense that, you know, I kept pushing her away. It was the argument where, you know, kind of enough is enough. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go home. Um, is at that point, um, she, you know, prior to that, you know, she was screaming and carrying on throughout the house. But at that point I went to go leave. She attempted to grab my keys. Well, she did grab my keys and tried to bolt out the door and as she went to bolt out the door, the door, this being a door, the door open, she ran smack into the door, side of the door, as she walked out, as she ran out. So she grabbed my keys and turned and hit the door, the open door, and she tumbled out of the house. Um, the way that her house is set up there, there's a sidewalk, uh, and there's hedges on the other side of that, so three foot over hedges that carry on throughout the sidewalk. So she tumbled out the door and went over the hedges and was in the middle of the yard, um, still screaming, basically. Um, at that time, I, I walked around the, uh, the sidewalk and the hedges and I told her, I said, please get in the house. You know, you're, this is too loud for out here. This is too much, you know, please come in. Let's, everything will be okay. Let's, you know, talk about this inside. I don't want to involve the neighbors. And this, granted, this is 11 something at night. Um, in the middle of a neighborhood, in the middle of her yard, front yard. So she ended up coming in the house um, and she went to, you know, I said, hey, let's get some water. She- can, At this point in time, Mr. Paschal, can you describe her physical appearance? Uh, this time she had, she had a red mark. There wasn't a knot on her head yet at that point. Um, but you can, it was a hard hit. I mean, you can tell that something was gonna happen. But she had some blood coming out of her nose. Um, and at that time, that's all I saw. I didn't see anything with her lip at that time. What happened next? Uh, she made it, she, she came back in um, willingly and went and I said, you need to get some water. Let's calm down, let's just calm the situation down. Um, she went and we went to the, the, the kitchen and we got some water. We actually both drank some water. Um, and I was like, right, let's have a little more, you know, let's have a little more. So I, I tried to involve myself in it. Um, 
and pretty much everything had calmed down. Um, I said, you know, let's go get you cleaned up. Um, are you feeling okay? How how are you? You know, how bad are you hurt? Kind of thing. Um, and she said, just basically, she said, just leave me alone. She she wasn't in a good mood, but she wasn't yelling anymore. Um, so she went and she used the bathroom and she wiped herself up, and um, we pretty much went to bed after that. All right, and you went to bed. Um, at the time that yourself and Miss Wilson Chapman arrived home, can you tell the jury what your opinion was on your respective sobriety? We were both drinking. Um, we the term drunk. I mean, we're drunk. We're both we're drunk. So you go to bed in your mind. What did you think? Your mind that, you know, she, she's calmed down, that everything's going to, she's going to wake up, you know, and, and everything's going to be fine. What happened next? Um, I was lying next to her, and she got up, started walking to the door, uh, her, her door of her bedroom, and I, I said, Kristen, what are you doing? Where are you going? And she walked to the front door, and I... I walked behind her and she walked out of the house and started walking down the road. And I said, I stood at the door, opened the door and I stood at the door. I said, Kristen, what are you doing? She goes, I'm calling the cops. Uh, just get out of here. And I said, that's what I was going to do to begin with. Um, and so I, I just chalked it up that she was drunk and was going to walk it off and walk back. And roughly 30 minutes later, the police showed up. And in the interim, what, what did you do? Did you, did you leave the house? Did you stay there? There was no reason for me to leave. I, I stayed there. I, I, I hadn't done anything wrong at that point. All right, the police arrive um, approximately how long after she exited the house? I want to say roughly 30 minutes. And you saw excerpts of a, a body cam footage from the officers uh, do you recall them responding to the residents? I did. And it appeared that you were lying down or asleep. Where, where were you when they, they arrived? I was just lying in the bed. I was awake just lying in the bed. And when they asked you what happened, you recall you didn't hesitate. You pointed to a place on the wall. Tell the jury what you were doing. It was pointing to herself, pointing on the wall where she had she had ran into the wall i mean she she was we were both drunk as i said and she was she and she went into the house and um you know turned on light switches did this did that all that stuff happened that that's the truth um and so she she bounced around the wall and that was one part of the wall where she come down the stairs and um i bumped into now you heard miss wilson chapman testify about an elaborate process about you having your phone and somehow being able to dismantle the screen and then putting a cord in the phone and a UV port then putting it in a computer and for over an hour or so deleting, downloading, etc. Tell the jury, did that happen? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. And, and did you delete references to yourself? Never, no. I didn't, I, I didn't have a password to get into her phone. Uh, that was one thing that she changed pretty frequently. Um, and I can't even get in. When Ms. Chapman was testifying and, and told me that she had pictures of you all at, at dinner, if you'd have deleted her phone, those wouldn't be there, I assume. That's correct. Um, did you ever see the condition of her phone that night? I did. Mm -hmm. And tell the jury about that. Uh, when she had tumbled out the door, uh, her, her phone was there. I had picked it up. Um, I brought it in. Uh, the screen had popped off. It, it wasn't broken. It wasn't cracked. It wasn't anything. It had just popped away a little bit. And basically, I, I pushed it back in. May I approach? Well, first, let me, let me preface this by saying, after June 9th, did you have any contact with Miss 
Wilson Chapman. She tried. She attempted to contact me multiple times. Did you ever contact her? No, never. May I approach? Mr. Paschal, let me show you what has been marked as Exhibit 61. Ask you to review uh, that exhibit and if you can identify it for the record. These are text messages uh, between Kristen and myself. Uh, Your Honor, may we at this time utilize the overhead? Amen. If we could, Mr. Hammonds, if you could. And if we could dim the lights just to. Uh, a bit, Mr. Bailiff. All right. Describe to the jury, Mr. Paschal, what we're looking at on page one of Exhibit 61. This is a uh, text messages between her, between her and myself. Um, and at the very top is is actually a, a website concerning a squirrel. A squirrel had fallen at my house out of a tree and it was just a baby and it, um, I tried to nurture it back to health. Um, and so she sent me, she had sent me this concerning making sure that it gets the proper nutrients. And under the icon for metabolic bone, bone disease, squirrels, uh, can you read into the record the date? Uh, it's June 9th, 2019, at 7.18 p.m. All right, and, and did that text, that, that you did you receive the text on the, the metabolic bone disease from Ms. Wilson Chapman? I did. When, when was that received? That was probably two or three days prior to June 9th. Um, then under that text message, there are two dated June 9th and June 13th with some emojis. Uh, can you tell the jury who they are from? Uh, that's Kristen Wilson Chapman, and that's how she was programmed into my phone. Um, Kristen with a heart face and then heart eyes and then a little family emoji. And the one on the night we're talking about at 718, it said she stopped sharing location with you. Yes. Is that, does that accurately depict that text? That's, that's correct. And also uh, at 836, same message, correct? That's correct. Now. The next message is dated September 13, 2019 at 10.21 in the morning. Uh, can you read to the jury what that text message says? Hi, happy belated birthday. It's been so long, I really missed you. And who is that text message from? That was Miss Kristen Wilson Chapman. And when was your birthday, Mr. Paschal? It was actually the day prior, September 12th. All right, six days later, September 18th, 2019, at 1.23 p.m., uh, can you read the next text into the record? I really feel bad about everything, Jeffrey. I think things have just gone too far and I'm too deep in. I'm not sure how to make things right with you. I had to get a new phone, BTW, by the way. And who is that text message from? Miss Kristen Wilson Chapman. The next test message is dated September 19, 2019. Can you read that text message into the record? Um, was really looking forward to seeing you today. And if we could go to the next page. And who is that text message from? Miss Kristen Wilson Chapman. And can you put that message in context for the jury? We actually had a court that day, a court hearing that day that um, was canceled. And so I wasn't in court and she wasn't in court, so she didn't, we didn't see each other physically. Uh, a few days later, September 29, 2019, at 11.02 p.m., can you read to the jury those texts? Hi, hey, sorry for the late text. I've been thinking a lot about you a lot. I feel like I'm just settling with everything. Who's those t who is the text messages from? That was Miss Kristen Wilson Chapman. October 8th, can you read that text message? Really wish you wouldn't ignore me 
and an emoji with the crying. Uh, October Thursday, October tenth, one forty nine p.m. November seventeenth at eight nineteen a.m. You should have responded to me. This is your fault by acting like you're above me. I told you not to leave me. All you had to do was take care of me. And this, this has blown up and now I can't stop it. In fact, I don't even want to now. I'll do everything I can for you to lose Kevin. And who are those text series of text messages from? They were all from Kristen Wilson. -Chapman. Now, Mr. Paschal, as, as we're looking at these, I, I noticed that there's no response to you regarding these texts that are spanning the next few months. That's correct. Did you ever text back Ms. Wilson Chapman? Absolutely not. Why not? Well, I, I believed with these text messages I was being set up. Um, there was actually a pending uh, order of protection or restraining order. And um, I was emphatically told, do not communicate with Ms. Wilson. All right. December 22nd, read the next series of text messages. family and peace. It didn't have to be this way. You should have responded back to me. Good luck proving everything, BTW, by the way. Erase all the pics and texts, and I'll tell the truth. And who is that series of text messages from? Ms. Kristen Wilson Chapman. And in terms of placing it in context for the jury, when she says erase the pics and text, what type of pics uh, do you know that she was referring to? Objection, Judge. I'll withdraw. I'll withdraw the question. Thank you. Now, Mr. Paschal, if we can turn the lights on, please. Can you describe to the jury how you were able to take pictures or screenshots of your iPhone? Just simply walk us through iPhone. Uh, for dummies and tell us how, how you did it. I have, I had at the time an iPhone that had the little home button and the power button and all you do is you push the home button and the power button at the same time and it takes a, whatever's on your screen, it records everything on your screen. And do those screenshots of the text messages accurately reflect the content, the date and the time of text that you received from this Kristen Wilson Chapman? 100%. Your witness. Can we approach? No. Okay, direct examination of the defendant concluded. Philip Dubé, what do you think? He's a very likable witness. He has a very tranquil demeanor. He's a success story. He's very relatable. Uh, the, the problem is there is no smooth segue or transition from having a good time to this sudden onset of aggression. But having said that, if the oh, jury believes their story... Yeah. Sorry. Let's listen in. Let's sure. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, so pick up your thought, uh, Philip. You know, a lot of people think the opposite. Our producer in the courtroom believes that the jury is um, not buying him. And uh, at least before the text messages came in, especially some male jurors were mad-dogging him, according to our producer in the courtroom. That may have changed after they heard the text messages. I don't know. Um, but pick up where you left off the the issue with his story is the um, you're saying the 0 to 100 scenario yeah i mean they're having a lovely evening. They're at the cafe or this, you know, bistro having a lovely dinner and drinks. They go home. I guess they're going to pick up where they left off, go out and get more drinks. And then all of a sudden you have this abrupt transition from a lovely evening to this conduct involving physical aggression. The, the segue is weird. You would have to believe that she's some type of psychopathic drunk. 
that all of a sudden, once the alcohol is absorbed in her system, she becomes a mad woman and gets physically aggressive. It's, it's a very strange transition. On the other hand, on the stand, he doesn't lose his cool yet. He's very tranquil, very relatable. Uh, for purposes of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, if a jury believes them equally, it means he should be acquitted because the prosecution didn't meet their burden. If you believe them equally, 50-50, that's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So, you know, uh, we'll and see don't what they happens do, on cross. Uh, don't they also, if a jury is told two different stories and both are plausible and um, uh, they need to go to the one that leads towards innocence? Innocence, exactly. I mean, that's a standard jury instruction throughout this country. If the evidence is subject to two or more reasonable interpretations, one pointing to guilt and one pointing toward innocence, the jury is required to adopt the interpretation that points towards innocence and acquit the defendant. Because if you should only have one interpretation. If the prosecution wants to prove its case, there should only be one final conclusion, and that's guilt. But if you really don't know, it could go either way. It means you have a reasonable doubt, and that doubt goes to the defendant. The tie goes to the defendant. The frustration we saw with the prosecutor while the jury was not in the room during the proffer um, can't happen in front of the jury, obviously. Um, what, do you, what, what are you looking for here? What do you expect on this cross? Do you keep it short knowing you're likely going to have this rebuttal um, for the he said, she said conclusion? Or do you keep him on there forever and, and try to stumble and get, get, him, get him frustrated? Well, I think what I would do is try to get him frustrated because at some point she's going to put him in a posture where he's going to end up blaming his lawyer for everything. You know, why is it all of a sudden now or a year later we're getting all these screenshots? So you want this jury to believe that you waited all this time, you gave them to your lawyer, then your lawyer suddenly a year into it turns it over? Okay. And that's typical. You know, we have these situations oftentimes where the client is sort of losing and then they throw their own lawyer under the bus and a jury might not take kindly to it because now you're putting your lawyer in evidence. It actually puts you in conflict with your own lawyer. But hopefully this lawyer, he's a, a solid stand-up guy, will know how to rehabilitate him and, and ask the proper questions um, on redirect. The, um, the, the, basically the state has to, in its questioning of the witness here, confront him, right, and say, isn't it true you fabricated these text messages. Just be very clear and see his reaction because, again, with their rebuttal witness, it's going to come down to who do you believe? Of course. And then I would also parade the photos of her injuries, you know, and just, you know, show them to him and put them on the Elmo, the overhead, so the jury can see her all blown up on the overhead screen as he's talking about it. And when you look at the injuries, they, they didn't just come out of the firmament. You know, they obviously happened somehow. And uh, I don't know, it, it might be a reach to suggest that these are all self-inflicted. I mean, if you think about it, uh, Ted, how would you cause that type of contusion to your forehead of all places? It's a weird place to have an injury. Most people, if they're going to, you know, self-inflict a facial injury, it's going to be to the cheek you know, maybe to the chin, but to your forehead as a practical matter, how would you even inflict it? Are you going to take an object and just slam it into your own head? It kind of doesn't make sense. And a jury might have a hard time believing that. Now, on the other hand, her injuries do not jive with what she said went down. What, the way she characterized that whole course of conduct, the way he was dragging her around by her hair, almost like a caveman, you would think she would be far more injured than how she presents in the photos. So a jury might think that maybe she was cuckoo and, as we say in the public defender world, cray-cray, you know, and just fabricated this whole thing to take him down. Well, we don't know. We'll have he to just, wait and see. He just said under oath that uh, she ran into the door, that the, the door was open and... Um, they were going from zero to 60. He comes back with the dog. She sees him on the phone and freaks out and then runs and boom, hits her head on the door. Um, I, you know, this, this is a fascinating case. It's the ultimate he said, she said. 
It's a very plausible explanation. You know, listen, at the end of the day, when somebody has injury, the prosecution still has to prove causation. If there was a willful infliction of some type of traumatic injury like this, there still has to be a causal connection between the defendant and the injury. And if there was some supervening cause where she trips over her feet down the stairs or she runs into a door, you know, you don't blame the defendant for that. You know, there is just like this causal break in that chain of causation that cannot redound to his detriment. Let's assume, you know, that's really how it happened. It's not necessarily self-inflicted. It all occurred accidentally during uh, an argument. And to blame him for her own injuries where she just lost her footing or, or took a bad step or plowed into a door, it's not his fault. The bottom line is one of these two individuals is lying through their teeth and they did it under oath in front of this jury. If a juror Absolutely. is, if you have um, jurors that think, you know what, I don't trust that guy. Uh, I think he's lying. But now in closing, the defense gets up and says, here's the law. If these are two viable stories, you have to go this way. Is that... Um, what we should expect from the defense? And isn't it kind of advantage defense when you have two competing stories that make sense? Oh, of course. I hammer that instruction all the time in criminal cases, especially when you have a he said, she said situation. And by the way, Ted, in criminal trials, you know what my favorite number is? Hmm. One, the number one. You know why? Because we only need one juror to hold up this entire verdict. You don't necessarily have to convince 12. The law does not require that all jurors reach a unanimous verdict. They can each stand their ground. There's also a jury instruction where they are required and told that their verdict must be their own. You know, it's not a majority rule situation where you throw in the towel during deliberations just to get out of there and go home and call it a day. You have to give your... Um, your meaningful input, you have to deliberate meaningfully. Otherwise, you end up convicting innocent people. And if you have one or two who want to hold out, then so be it. Let's retry this. How about the uh, question that we all had before this proffer of, well, why didn't someone come in here from a phone company and you already talked about and, and, and basically legitimize these texts? How do you get that across to the jury now on cross-examination, because right now jurors are thinking that. They're thinking, wow, these texts are real. This changes everything. But the state has to get out that they think not only that these texts are made up by you, Mr. Liar Defendant, but how do you then tell the jury, we tried to do it, but at and didn't help us with this. You know, they, they, we, couldn't, we couldn't verify them. Is that in closing? It is, but you have to be careful because remember, a foundation was already laid uh, for the introduction of these texts outside the presence of the jury, where the court found that uh, they were properly authenticated and a foundation was laid. You know, there has to be some evidence then in response to that showing that they were fabricated, that they were altered, that they were just, in fact, you know, made up. If you don't have mm. that evidence, yeah. I don't even think you should be allowed to argue it. Philip DeBay, thank you for your uh, expert opinion. Oh, pins and needles. We have cross-examination of the defendant coming up next. We'll slip in a break here. You're watching Court TV. Your front row seat to justice. Julie Grant's next. Stay with us.